Good evening to everyone joining us for this fourth webinar discussing the situation in Ukraine. Um, in light of the recent developments, I think we can all agree that it is about time that justice is served for victims of crimes committed in Ukraine, be it in international courts or domestic courts. So we have recently learned the ICC prosecutor has announced the opening of the investigation and on 26th of January of this year, the Grand Chamber of the European Court of Human Rights held a hearing in the interstate case, which also involves the downing of the MH17. And also importantly, the question of effective control over the territory from which the book surface to air missile was launched on 17th of July, uh, 2014, killing 298 civilians, including 80 children. The MH17 case is also heard at the District Court of The Hague, where four defendants have been charged by the prosecution after the joint investigative team delivered its findings. Today, we are joined by some wonderful speakers to share greater details with us, namely Elliot Higgins, founder and creative director of Bellingcat. Bellingcat investigation team has, for instance, provided the origin and movements of the book Missile Launcher and Pete Bluch chairman of the MH17 Disaster Foundation, gathering the relatives of the direct victims of the disaster. For obvious reasons related to the Russian aggression in Ukraine, Margarita Sokorenko from the Office of the Agent before the European Court of Human Rights, the Minister of Justice of Ukraine has apologized herself for not being able to join us today. Each speaker will have up to 10 minutes for the intervention, but before I pass floor to Elliot to share with us Bellingcat's findings and myths and counterclaims surrounding the downing of the flight, I invite our audience to leave their questions in the Q&A box anytime during this webinar. And once the interventions of our speakers are finished, we will proceed with the questions. Uh, please also speak specify if you are addressing the question to both speakers or just to one of our today's speakers. Uh, Elliot, I pass the virtual mic to you and the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's obviously a very, um, very changeable period, I think, in the relationship between Russia and the West. Um, and I, I kind of foremost in my mind is how this is going to impact um, both the trial in the Netherlands and also the international attempts at accountability around MH17. I think many of the actions being taken at the moment in the West with regards to sanctions um, and uh, other actions really should have been taken when MH17 was shot down, not now. And had it been taken, maybe we wouldn't be in the situation we are now with Ukraine being invaded. Um, so we're also now looking at the court cases. We have um, the defense will be presenting their case soon. Um, I think that's going to be something that's very difficult for them to do in the current circumstances, um, not least uh, because one thing that we found very interesting during the our investigation process and talking to the joint investigation team is how much the um, what we call the counterfactual community around MH17 played in uh, kind of preempting the defences that could be made in court, the non-legal defences, that is the um, claims that imagery have, has been falsified or comes from unreliable sources or there's some kind of issue with um, some of the public imagery that's there. And alongside that, we also now have the information that's come from the joint investigation team itself um, and what's being used by the prosecution that goes beyond the open source material. That is extremely compelling evidence um, of all the aspects of the case. Um, so the defense has a very difficult position. I mean, they also have the position now that they're representing people on behalf of effectively an extremely unpopular regime at the moment. Um, so. I, I am curious to see how they're actually going to present things in court. I am also curious if they're even able to get paid anymore because of the sanctions. So maybe they just worked up because they haven't had their bills paid recently. Um, but you know, beyond that, obviously, I mean, I think everyone who's you know familiar with the case and is familiar with you know the reality of the situation understands that you know there will be guilty verdicts co coming, and. Um, what that actually means now is a little bit difficult to say because you know we expect these verdicts in the later part of the year. Um, the question is then 
what impact will that have? There's only so many sanctions that we can put on Russia, and it seems that quite a lot of them are being put on at the moment. So I think what this will more likely do is make sure that those sanctions and other, um, you know, things that have been done with Russia are kept in place. I mean, we know from our own research that we'll be publishing in the coming uh, weeks and months that we have more in Russia that will be of relevance to the international community um, outside of MH17. So I think there will be a fairly constant drumbeat of bad news for Russia that will remind people of why these sanctions are in place in the first place. And I think at this point, um, you know, with regards to Ukraine, uh, Putin has a lose-lose situation. I mean, if he, you know, pulls out and tries to get the sanctions listed, they'll, lifted, it'll be a massive embar personal embarrassment for him, and um, he'll be seen as a failure in the eyes of, you know, his supporters, and everyone who isn't his supporter inside Russia and outside Russia will still be furious with him. Anyway, if he keeps fighting this conflict, it's likely to be a very violent and bloody conflict. There will be losses on both sides. There will be images coming out from Ukraine that will be horrific and they will be well covered. Um, there are ongoing activities that we're involved with to collect evidence through open sources uh, and preserve that evidence for future accountability work. Um, what's been quite different between um, the situation in 2014 and what's happening now is um, the kind of open source community around Ukraine kind of has, is, exists, um, you know, existed from day one of this conflict and even prior to that, this conflict, you know, breaking out when videos and photographs of Russian troop mo movements, um, the same sort of ones we saw when we were studying MH17 were being identified before the invasion and geolocated and information being kind of gathered from that because this community exists already who are just an online community of people who are you know have been following the conflict since 2014 and have a lot of experience and that's allowed us to feed that immediately into a process of data collection and verification um, that was being put into archives of information that will be made accessible to any accountability process that requires them and we're already in contact with a number of organizations who are either, either uh, legal organizations you know lawyers asking for information or directly with accountability organizations who are working on these cases so there's a very clear desire for that information to be um, sh shared and used by those organizations which is a real shift from what we saw in 2014 and I think really a lot of those lessons um, were learned by those kind of organizations because of you know the aftermath of MH17 that there was this recognition of the value of the open source evidence even though it took a you know probably a couple of years really for that to propagate among those kind of communities but now it has um I, I think it is especially with the conflict in Ukraine as it is at the moment looking back at that MH17 evidence I think it you know with the court trial coming up very soon again I think we're going to have that in the, the kind of a mind of a lot of people it may I think reignite a lot of interest in the case um internationally um and I think that could have a real impact on how um you know again the kind of West perceives these sanctions that these are not just temporary measures but these are long-term measures that need to be in place in Putin until Putin is no longer in power thank you very much Elio thank you for highlighting the contrast with 2014 the, the challenges that we're facing back then uh, the open source community especially um, now let's give the opportunity to the other speaker. Uh, Pete, can you perhaps um, perhaps share how victims perceived the proceedings and uh, how it impacted their life from the beginning? Uh, yes, I can. Uh, um, but first of all, um, you know, on the 17th of July 2014, uh, MSF was shot down by uh, with a bug surface to air missile, and that missile came from the 53rd Russian Army Brigade in, uh, in, in Kursk and have been secretly transported across the border to a field near Perfomaisky, right under a busy international air route, escorted by separatists supported by Russia. And after the shooting down uh, of Flight MH17, the book system was quickly returned to Russia. The shooting down of Flight MH17 killed 298 innocent passengers and crew members, and in effect, they were the first non-Ukrainian victims of a war that started eight years ago. And the first non-Ukrainian victims of the aggression of Putin in Ukraine. From the outset, the relatives have faced opposition from the Russian-backed separatists, making the re repatriation of victims difficult and often disrespectful. Russia also blocked with a veto in the UN Security Council an, in an initiative to try to try those responsible before the international tribunal. And next of kin 
from 17 countries had to deal with the loss of their loved ones in the aftermath of this crime, which continues to this day. An aftermath that's about a great psychosocial consequences for the next of kin, financial problems, loss of relationships, derailment within families. We call this the disaster after disaster, which has been going on for seven and a half years now. Last September and November, uh, maybe you can remember, 104 relatives exercised their rights to address the court. And all 104 statements were as impressive as they were said. But also the anger of the relatives about the constant obstruction by Russia in all investigation and all legal procedures, the disinformation and lies came forward in almost all speeches of the next of kin. After the disaster, of the, the Dutch Safety Board initiated uh, an investigation into the cause of the disaster. Parallel to this, the criminal investigation was started by the Joint Investigation, uh, you mentioned it, consisting of re representatives of the police and prosecutor offices of the Netherlands, Ukraine, Belgium and Malaysia. The Joint Investigation carried out further investigations into the origin of the book system, the course of events prior to the shooting of the flight MH17 and the events immediately afterwards. It also of course, into the persons who were responsible for the downing of flight and theft. And Belliquet also did extensive research. And uh, Elliot Akins told, told, uh, told us so. In March 2020, the investigation led to the start of a criminal investigation against the first, first four suspects in, in the District Court of The Hague. And to this day, next of kin are involved in a number of legal proceedings. And I will go through them. The criminal case. 94 days of court hearings have been held in the criminal case against the first four su suspects up till now. Three subjects, suspects are participating in the trial and are tried in absentia. Suspect Pulatov is, is represented by two Dutch lawyers. The next of kin are represented by a team of eight lawyers. And in the criminal case, the following questions need to be answered. Was the plane shot down by a cruise missile? Is the missile filed from a field near Pervomaisky? And did the suspects have a role, if any? And did they commit any crimes? And which crimes? The, the prosecution has presented overwhelming evidence in this case, drawn from countless tapped conversations, satellite images, photos and videos, witness statements, open sources, investigation by domestic and foreign uh, institutes, etc. The criminal file comprises at last at least. 65,000 pages. And in the indictment in December last year, the prosecution demanded life sentences against four suspects. Next week, on the 7th of, uh, of, of, uh, of March, the trial will resume and we will listen to the plea of Pulatov's lawyers for 12 days of sessions, 12 days. We know that these four will never serve their sentences if convicted, but it's important for us that an independent court makes a ruling. That verdict will also make clear what role Russia has had, because if the courts confirms that the book system was a Russian system and the book was fired from a location under control of the Russian back separatists, then the role of Russia and Russia's responsibility is proven. The criminal investigation into others involved in the shooting down of MH17 is still ongoing. It concerns those who press the button, the crew of the book trailer, but also those higher up in the hierarchy, right up to the Kremlin. According to the public prosecutor's office, this investigation is still is in its final stage, but we must wait and see whether any prosecution decision will be made. And then the proceedings before the European Court of Human Rights, it, it gets complicated. 482 relatives have complained to the European Court of Human Rights about the human rights violation due to the downing of flight MH17 and Russia's questionable role in the aftermath of the disaster. The court has yet to make a decision on the admissibility of the complaints before the substantive hearing can begin. But first, the interstate complaints from the Netherlands and Ukraine are dealt with by the Grand Chamber of the European Court. The Netherlands have filed a complaint with the European Court against Russia for the downing of flight MH17, and Ukraine has filed a complaint against Russia for human rights violation in Ukraine, including MH17. These complaints 
will be dealt with simultaneously by the European Court. The first hearing of the court took place on the 26th of January with delegations from the Netherlands and Ukraine facing the Russian delegation. And I must say that was a very impressive hearing because the tensions between Russia and Ukraine were, were there on a, very, on a very high point, a very high uh, level. Um, but also a small group of relatives, about four relatives filed a complaint with the European court against Ukraine because Ukraine had not closed their airspace. This case is still ongoing also. Other relatives, almost all, gave priority to tracking down and prosecuting those who were shot, those who shot down the plane. But moreover, the absence of a decision to close the airspace does not give anyone carte blanche to shoot down a civilian airplane. The Netherlands and Australia have also formally held Russia liable for the shooting down of Flight M17. And this is a procedure under international law whereby efforts must first be made to find a solution by diplomatic means. But Russia has walked out of the diplomatic talks and the Netherlands and Australia are considering the next steps. Relatives have now become involved in complex procedure in a complicated geopolitical context. And all these procedures also affect each other. The ongoing proceedings, all the information about them and also disinformation Russia's obstruction and total indifference to the fate of the victims and their next of kin add to the suffering of the next of kin. A day, the next of kin continue to fight for justice to be done. You know, in September last year, one of the next kin stated, and I quote, I hope one day to conclude the air disaster in the knowledge that justice has been done, in the knowledge that civilization overcomes barbarism. Putin's insane war in Ukraine makes everything even more complicated. But first of all, our thoughts are especially with the people of Ukraine, who are currently suffering greatly under Putin's aggression. But we still hope that in the end, civilization overcomes barbarism. Thank you. Thank you very much for your intervention. Uh, I think you nicely highlighted the obstructions that um, Russia has been doing all the time. Uh, that brings me to my first question for both of you. Uh, to what extent do you believe that national and international proceedings are presently paralyzed by uh, or obstructed by, by uh, these actions uh, by Russia? Because, uh, for instance, uh, Elliot, in, in a TEDx talk, you mentioned that uh, you mentioned the power of truth in a post-truth world when uh, facts are distorted. And in international law, under the concept of uh, the right to the truth, uh, there is an obligation of the state to provide information to victims or to their families or even the society as a whole about the circumstances surrounding um, the human rights violations or international crimes. So my question is from your perspective, also the work that you have done, um, to what extent are presently courts paralyzed by these massive uh, state sponsored disinformation campaigns? Well, I, I don't think the disinformation is really that much of an issue now because, you know, with the case of MH17, I mean, there's been so much research done on it, both for the open source research and now, you know, the work that we're seeing from the joint investigation team and the prosecutor's office in the trial. I mean, it's extremely detailed. Um, they've preemptively addressed a lot of the disinformation that has been spread around MH17. I think they may have even set a couple of traps for the Russians by, you know, for example, presenting the missile casing where Russia presented falsified logs to claim Ukraine had it, and the, the prosecution had a bit of extra information that proved that Russia was actually lying about that. Um, you know, their attempts to fake imagery, you know, in the early days of um, after the downing, the fake satellite imagery and the lies about the radar information, that's all been exposed to be, you know, falsifications from the Russian side. And as I said before that, you know, the defense is in a difficult position because in a way, 
the kind of conspiracy theorists have crowdsourced every possible explanation there could be in defense of Russia. And they've all been debunked over the years by you know, either organizations like Burning Cat or by the police themselves. And that's certainly been reflected in what we're seeing in the trial as well. But the fact is the evidence they have is extremely compelling. I mean, there's very clear evidence of where the missile launcher was, where it traveled from, every single aspect of it. Now, you know, those laws may try and make legal arguments that, you know, we shouldn't be in this court, but, you know, those arguments were presented long ago in the initial um, days of the trial, and you know they've been dismissed by the court. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think disinformation is anything to worry about. And in the current context with Ukraine, I mean, obviously there's going to be accountability efforts there. Um, I, I think the thing with Russian disinformation is, it's not, it, a lot of people think it's like amazing. It's like really, you know, clever and oh, it's, it's something to be really scared of. It's actually really dumb, but there's just so much of it, and it's never really been properly addressed. And what's happening with the current conflict in, in Ukraine is because because we have this pre-existing open source community, it's being addressed almost in real time. And it makes it difficult for those counterfactual communities who want to latch onto some sort of theme to find one that they can latch onto because all the videos and photographs they use to justify them are being debunked before they even get to see them. Um, and I think that kind of, in a way, you know, the, with regards to Ukraine at the moment, it feels like there's been almost this kind of inoculation against disinformation. The kind of information body has these white blood cells, which are these communities of fact checkers that have kind of emerged within the community that are immediately responsi- responding to the kind of uh, the virus of disinformation as it enters that kind of information body, to use a you know COVID metaphor we're all familiar with. But it's it's something that's changed a lot. And I think now when we start thinking about MH17, I'm hoping when the trial restarts, we'll, the international community will pay more attention to it. I think, um, you know, I, I'm really interested to see what the defense is going to be because it's going to have to be pretty spectacular to be something that hasn't been thought up already by a bunch of conspiracy theorists on the internet and already debunked. So... I have absolutely no idea what they're going to be able to present. I mean, I, if I were those defense lawyers, I'd be embarrassed to turn up in court and present you know, a defense at this point. I mean, the case is so strong and with what's happening with Russia at the moment, I don't think it's a particularly popular situation to be in. But of course, you know, everyone des- def- defer- um, deserves a defense and they deserve lawyers to make that defense. And it had to be what some lawyers who do that, but it's still very difficult to see, you know, a case being presented when you hear that, you know, there was this kind of claims that some of the members of this conspiracy community on MH17 have been asked to present or create kind of evidence for the um, uh, defense or share their findings with the defense, which is, you know, like asking 9-11 truthers to appear in court to explain what happened to the Twin Towers. It's ridiculous, but we shall see. Uh, thank you. Uh, Pete, would you like to follow up with the, with the question? Uh, you know, uh, I have full confidence in the court and uh, uh, all presented evidence is validated, is checked, checked, double checked. Uh, uh, national and international institutions have looked at, looked at, uh, uh, at the investigation, uh, at the tapes, uh, if, if, if they aren't uh, uh, falsified, etc., etc. Cetera, et cetera. So uh, there's a lot of checked and double checked and validated information and uh, uh, the court uh, uh, you know that the court bases it, its verdict on what's in the file and not what's uh, on Twitter. Uh, uh, so I'm I'm not worried about it at all, and um, I I think it's very important to to have trust in uh, in in uh, the verdict uh, of the court, whatever the verdict may be. Um, and you know all this and uh, this information. Uh, and also what the, uh, the lawyers of Pulato say in, uh, during uh, the, uh, the first 49 uh, uh, hearings, uh, it's annoying. Uh, uh, it makes us angry so now and then, and uh, it's difficult to hear, but not more than that. And uh, uh, I can't imagine that the defense of Pulato uh, can prove uh, uh, an, an total other scenario than than it's proven by uh, by the Dutch prosecuting uh, office. Uh, it 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 was a Russian book. It wasn't a Ukrainian book. It weren't uh, 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 fighter jets. Uh, uh, it came from a, a field near Pervomaisky and not anywhere else. So uh, no, I'm 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 not worried about that. Uh, but I'm. <laughs> They, they 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 need twelve days to present their uh, their their case. Twelve days. That's that's a lot. And 
uh, I've understood that they have that they will come with new reports of uh, of uh, 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 of researchers. I don't know. We'll hear uh, in the end end of the year. Um, the court will give us verdict, and that's the most important. Uh, now that we have touched upon this information, we have one question uh, and I will quote what challenges other than uh, usual disinformation challenges do you now expect for gathering information for justice mechanisms we can I, I think we can go in the same uh, order of answers yeah so um it, it's it's been interesting to see the kind of different kind of dynamics at play with the current situation. It's, it's not that it's hard to find information at the moment. I mean, in the sense we're completely overwhelmed with information. It, it's more that now um, to actually make this stuff useful, we need to collect it in a way that can then, then be archived it for future accountability purposes and add a lot of useful metadata and basically coordinates of where stuff was filmed so people can search for it later who are working for accountability mechanisms. So the difficult part at the moment is really about having the resources and the time to be able to do that with as many videos as possible. And so at Bellingcat, we're working with partner organizations to build that capacity um, so that we have, you know, capture everything. Because one thing we learned with MH17 is you have to understand Bellingcat when it was launched was basically me by myself and then a team of volunteers came together around MH17 and we kind of figured out how to do all this stuff as we were going. It wasn't like we were referring back to early investigations and did this kind of thing because there were none. It was something that we were doing um, in the moment and that was very... Um, it, it meant that stuff like videos and photographs and social media posts weren't preserved in any way because we weren't thinking that they would be used as evidence in the future. So when it then came to, um, you know, the, the official investigation, you know, and we started being contacted by different kinds of um, legal processes around this, it was very difficult to, in some cases, to find the original links because they'd been, you know, they'd been deleted or uh, they'd been made private because we'd been publishing about them and people didn't want to see it. You know, all the members of the 53rd Brigade obviously kept their social media profiles uh, private after we published about them. Um, and so that means when we're doing research now and when we're collecting evidence from a conflict, one of our main priorities is preservation. Because if we can preserve the stuff, we can research it, you know, over the following years and we know how long accountability processes can take. So having that there is very important. So we've been working with organisations, um, including Monomic Labs, who originally were known as the Syrian Archive, and they have been working on archiving literally millions of pieces of content from the conflict in Syria and archiving it in such a way that it can be used in accountability as evidence in the future. So we're using their technology to do that with the evidence from the current situation in Ukraine because we learned those lessons from MH17. Um, and as I said before, we have this community now that didn't exist, which makes the kind of discovery and the geolocation of this stuff a lot more rapid because people are doing that themselves. Um, you also have the fact that just the way in social media use has changed. I mean, for one thing, we've had, because of the work we did on MH17, and almost certainly with what we did with the 53rd Air Defence Brigade, the Duma passed a law to make it illegal for soldiers to share images of their service, which meant we aren't kind of you know, able to dig through the soul, you know, the soldiers own posts of them invading Ukraine at the moment. That doesn't exist. What you did have in the build up to the conflict is lots and lots of people um, using TikTok in particular to film convoys as they were driving around uh, Russia and share them on TikTok. And weirdly, TikTok has actually been, in a sense, a great social media sensor for collecting information and making that accessible to people because it encourages people to use video as well. It's rather than individual photographs, we get whole segments of videos with lots of vehicles driving past and lots of identifiable stuff. So. There is that massive information, and that's important because when you're dealing with future accountability efforts, one of the question will be who is responsible for this attack, not just the Russian Federation did it, but which specific units can be tied and where they are in a chain of command. And if we already know, for example, we've been looking at cluster munition uh, use by um, BM-30 and BM-27 multiple rocket launchers, and we can track those rocket launchers moving to the border with Russia in locations where these attacks have come from, thanks to those videos that were shared on TikTok. So that will help us understand the case more, and it's always an expansion of what we did with the MH17 case, where we tracked the convoy that had the missile launcher that shot down MH17 through Russia. That is now happening on actually a much larger scale than it was happening with um, in 2014, and in a way that's a lot more detectable because it's through popular social media channels, and you have the social media networks searching for that information and gathering it and doing their own bit of verification, which organizations like Bellingcat can also discover and actually make our job a lot easier because people have already you know, got coordinates of where it was taken and we can 
double check those very, very quickly rather than spending several hours geolocating individual videos. So um, I would say, you know, the difference is actually accountability in many senses has got a lot easier. I think what will be more difficult is the fact that when we get to these processes, I mean, Russia is not going to turn up at the International Criminal Court for their, you know, their day in court. Um, I mean, the way Russia is going, it's going to be like, you know, a new North Korea. I mean, it's just going to separate itself from the world and think it's can exist. I mean, I pity all the oligarchs around Putin whose rubles have suddenly become completely valueless and they must be wondering what went wrong. Um, but it's kind of like, you know, we are in a position now that you know is very different from where we were in 2014, and we had the same kind of evidence in 2014. But there is now, you know, a media that wants to see it and is interested in act proactively seeking it out from us. We have international accountability organisations who want it. We have all kinds of uh, NGOs, you know, human rights NGOs and NGOs working with you know victims of violence. They want it. So for us now, it's really about gathering this data to make it accessible to as many of those organizations as possible and also working with organizations to show them how to use open source evidence most effectively it's also about connecting with those communities and telling them these are the things that are interesting and these you know for example um you know we have been doing a lot of stuff writing about um cost munitions and that's one to make people aware that of their significance in conflict and to also to warn people not to you know go around picking them up which is something we saw a lot in syria in particular because these are unexploded ordnance if the submarine munitions don't go off um and it's kind of also about educating those networks about that and also the kind of potential of open source investigation within that material and then that kind of almost enriches the information about environment that is coming out of ukraine that we can then use in our own work Thank you, Elliot. Um, Pete? Yeah, well, what can I say more? Uh, uh, Bellingcat has had a, 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 a remarkable role in, uh, in the MH17 investigation, of course. Uh, we all know that uh, the, the joint investigation team gathered more, millions of, uh, of internet pages, uh, hundreds of thousands of, of pictures and videos, and uh, <coughs> Uh, a lot of, of that confer uh, conversations, uh, thousands of them. Um, but the uh, uh, Bellingcat helped the world, uh, I think, uh, with uh, with his open source investigation, and the world has learned a lot uh, uh, about it. Um, but this this wasn't the biggest investigation of uh, of the Netherlands in its in its history, and. Uh, um, it, it, it was a very complicated investigation. It was a lot, a lot, a lot of information. And uh, uh, it was very good that Bellingcat uh, helped the, the joint investigation team with, with, her, uh, with her information. Sometimes uh, Bellingcat was uh, a little bit earlier than, uh, uh, than the joint investigation team. Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, uh, the joint investigation team and the public prosecutor, they, they have to prove anything before court. and. Uh, uh, Bellingcat, Bellingcat had another position in the, in this, so uh, handling all information that's uh, that's uh, uh, about uh, about MHFD was extremely difficult. That is extremely diff difficult, and I, I think um, uh, maybe that's one of the reasons why the investigation that's still going on uh, is is so difficult. Uh, uh, you have get the proof from that information and uh, I, I don't think it's very easy to um, uh, uh, prove it for, before, before the court what the role of, uh, of, of Russia and uh, uh, what the Kremlin the role of Kremlin was in, uh, in the MH17 uh, case. So yes, uh, getting the information is very important but we are a little concerned now. Uh, the developments in Ukraine, uh, what are the consequences of the developments uh, in Ukraine for gathering more information? Because uh, the Ukrainian uh, Secret Service had a, a very significant role in, uh, in gathering more information. Uh, it's questionable if, uh, uh, if uh, they will succeed in, in, in the future. I don't know. Thank we you. Are about that. <laughs> And actually, that connects to our next question, which is, will the war have any more delays on the lawsuit? No. <laughs> I, can, I, I can be clear about that. Uh, um, uh, all information about the, the, the ongoing trial at this moment, the criminal trial in The Hague, 
uh, all the information is there. Uh, the court has has the, the criminal file, um, so there, the war will not affect, uh, in my opinion, uh, will not affect the criminal uh, the criminal proceedings at all. Uh, we have an independent court, and the independent court doesn't base their verdict on, uh, on on the news footages, but on the file, and the file is there. So in the end. Uh, uh, in this criminal case, there will be, on the end of the, this year, will be a verdict. And uh, uh, but you know, I'm a little worried about uh, uh, about the ongoing criminal investigations, who are not uh, 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 in the court yet. And, uh, but also the the, the proceedings uh, 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 with the uh, European Court. Uh, they'll also these proceedings will. Go on. Uh, I'm not worried about it at all. Uh, also, the European Court is an independent court. Okay, Russia is uh, pushed out of the court uh, of, of the European Council, um, and yeah, the European Court is, uh, is is part of the European, European Council. Uh, uh, but first, it, it, it were 17 judges. Possibly, uh, there are now 16 judges, uh, but. Uh, the cases before the European Court will still go on on the base of the evidence presented by the Dutch, Ukrainian, but also the defense of uh, uh, of the Russian uh, uh, lawyers. So uh, that will go on. I'm confident. Thank you for the answer. Uh, Elliot, would you like to touch upon it as well? Um, I, mean, I don't really have much to add to that. I mean, we're in a weird position at Bellingcat that we actually have court cases in Russia against us. So we aren't actually able to pay lawyers to defend us in Russia at the moment. So I mean, we weren't taking them very seriously anyway, but it's a funny position to be in that we can't actually... Uh... I'm also being um, sued in UK courts for libel by Evgeny Prigozhin, also known as Putin's chef. And I don't even know if he's able to pay his lawyers anymore. So it's kind of uh, been one of the unusual outcomes of this legal case, but I'm very glad it hasn't had an impact on the trials at the moment and the European Court of Human Rights case for MH17. Um, yeah, and it does it does concern me a bit with some of the other investigations that are going on to other individuals because the Ukrainian um, intelligence services have played a role in those investigations. And obviously this current situation, it means that information that's held inside Ukraine could, you know, God knows what could happen to that information if, um, you know, Russia is successful. But looking at what's happening at the moment in um, uh, Ukraine, Russia doesn't seem to be doing as well as it would have hoped to. And um, I think the kind of early prediction that many people had early in this conflict, that it would be brief, I think even Putin himself had thought that, is not going to come to pass. Um, and it may, so, but, so we're just going to have to wait and see what happens with those investigations. We actually have a, one specific question about that, and I quote, uh, it is true that the ICC prosecutor has initiated investigation. However, Russia is not bound by the Rome statute to cooperate to conduct investigation and or gather evidences. So how to overcome these challenges? Uh, let's start with Elliot. I think again, one of the things with the ICC cases um, you know, these cases take a very long time for them to build. And what we have very unusually with um, this case is, you know, a vast amount of open source information. Now, the ICC has used open source information in a small way before um, with a case from uh, Libya, where there was a Libyan uh, 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 military leader who was posting videos onto Facebook of him executing uh, people he claimed was were ISIS members. And there was no um, sign of due process to so the International Criminal Court actually used those videos by themselves to actually open, uh, issue an arrest warrant for the individual. Um, he was actually eventually killed, so that arrest warrant uh, was never served. But um, I, th I think the ICC is very open to using open source evidence to start building its cases. And, you know, this isn't a situation like we have in Syria, for example, where um, it's very difficult to get on the ground. I mean, there's plenty of people on the ground also gathering evidence that I already know a number of NGOs are gathering witness statements and other information. So this, um, you know, I, I, I think... Even though there's limitations to what the ICC can do as an organization, and especially you know if Russia, if Russia is not going to play ball, um, there's going to be you know a vast amount of evidence that will be coming out, and I think our ability to understand and analyze that evidence in the context of a legal cases improved a lot. 
Um, we actually have done, we've worked with the ICC in the past. Um, well, they've been on their technology advisory board and they've been very um, focused on over the last few years on the use of open source in their own work. Um, we've also been working to educate their um, the various advocates at the ICC by doing kind of mock um, kind of prosecutions and cross examinations with them using case studies from Ballingat and we've kind of posed as you know witnesses to present this evidence and um, we've also done other work outside of um, kind of the ICC working, um, for example, our investigations into um, Yemen and Saudi air airstrikes there. Um, we designed a process for investigation that was specifically designed to investigate crimes against humanity and violations of international humanitarian law using open sources to a standard where those investigations could then be submitted to processes like the International Criminal Court. Um, that work's been very successful. And our hope now is that we'll expand that into the work that we're doing with uh, Ukraine. But our, our current priority is to archive as much information as possible and in this somewhat kind of medium term do those in-depth investigations that can then be used for accountability in the future and i think that you know most of that stems from what we learned during um our mh17 investigation and that the reason we are in the position we are now is because of the interest around open source evidence and investigation into mh17 and how i think that because we had the joint investigation team coming to the same conclusions we did it kind of almost gave a you know a kind of kite mark seal of approval to what we'd actually been producing in the previous years um and i think that's playing a really important role now in how we understand conflict and my hope is that you know in 2014 I really felt what happened around MH17 was a real catalyst for the growth of online open source investigation um, in terms of how seriously it was taken as a field of investigation. Because before that, it was really seen as a you know, weird little hobby. Like I, I used to go to you know, journalism conferences and present the work and it was like I was doing magic tricks on stage. I was like pulling a rabbit out of the hat and showing them geolocations and stuff like that. Um, and it's become now, because of the work on MH17 in particular, I think something that's a lot more, understood by all kinds of mainstream organizations um, and as i said before they're seeking out this information from us directly and i think that you know will make a really big difference in the future and it's really you know because of the work we've done over those past past eight years thank you the same question for pete as we know that uh, the developments of the icc are very closely followed by the dutch society so i wonder how it is viewed by uh the dutch citizens um, you know, I don't, I don't know much about the ICC. Uh, I, I've read about it in the in the past few days. Uh, it's uh, it's very new to me. Uh, uh, the ICC has no role in the, in the uh, yet uh, uh, in the in the MH17 uh, 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 dossier. So I, it, it, it it's not sensible or sensible for me to to say anything about it because I don't know. And uh, of course. The Dutch people are following uh, the uh, the developments in, in Ukraine very closely, and they also will be following uh, the investigation of the ICC uh, in due time, uh, uh, absolutely. But uh, I think it's too early for me to say anything wise about this, so I, I don't. <laughs> Let's take a different question, this time for Elliot. That's about uh, nuclear weapons. Does Bellingcat have a line of investigation into Russia's nuclear capabilities and posture? Um, I mean, there's been kind of that one video that's been going around that's got people worried of uh, ICBM being moved. But um, I mean, there's very little. Open. Obviously, it's a, a quite a big secret and it's very difficult to you know, it, even with open source investigation, it, it's very difficult to really understand what they're doing. I mean, beyond the official announcements, there's you know not much evidence that you know supports kind of anything, any scenario either way at the moment. Um, so basically, what I'm saying is fingers crossed because it's obviously quite a scary threat at the moment that there is this nuclear threat hanging over us from Russia. Yeah. It's what Elliot said. Let's let's keep our fingers crossed, and uh, we are very about the development, uh, very uh, uh, worried about the developments in, uh, in Ukraine uh, and the acts of uh, of of the the lunatic uh, Mr. Mr. Putin. But uh, let's keep our fingers crossed that he won't uh, uh, use uh, nuclear weapons. It, it, it would be devastating for the world peace and uh, for everything, uh, everybody in the world. So. Uh, I don't know. I don't know much about it, but uh, 
I hope is just a threat and not more than that. Thank you for, for clarifying that. And Pete, in, in the latest European Court of Human Rights hearing, uh, you mentioned that victims of MH17, that they are forcefully now playing a role in the uh, power game of Russia. Can you perhaps yeah. elaborate what psychological impact it had on, on victims, on next of kin? Because uh, we remember 298 chairs in front of the Russian embassy yeah. in the Netherlands here. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it, uh, um, it, it has a, a great effect on, uh, on the uh, psychological effect on the, on the next of kin. Um, uh, it, it, it lengthens their, their suffering. And, uh, uh, you know, all next of kin, they want to get a chance to get rest and, uh, uh, and to, to, to give, it, give it a place. And, uh, uh, but the constant constant uh, denying and lying and uh, uh, alternative theories and uh, and obstructions of uh, of uh, uh, the Russian government in in all criminal proceedings uh, they are very difficult for uh, for the next of kin because the next of kin just want one thing they want justice to be served uh, they want the truth to come out they want to know what happened why it happened how it happened who was responsible and uh, Russia isn't uh, doing anything to get the truth uh, uh, in the open, and that's that's very difficult. And it uh, it keeps the the, the 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 grief going on with uh, uh, among the among the next of kin, and that's 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 very painful for them. And we heard that last year, hundreds of four uh, relatives told us how, how much pain it, uh, uh, it gives to, to, to the next of kin. And uh, of course, they have a lot of pain because they have lo lost their, their loved ones, but also the, the obstruction of, the, uh, of, 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 of Russia caused a lot, a, a lot of pain and, and, and anger on the, among the, the next of kin. And 104 of 104 uh, uh, relatives told the, the, the court uh, these these experiences and uh, no, it's for us very important that, that the truth comes out and that's why it's it's so important for us that the independent court comes to a verdict uh, uh, in the end of the year and and we hope uh, uh, the U European Court of Human Rights also but uh, these proceedings are usually taking six to seven years uh, at the European courts so uh, it gives Russia a chance to stay, keep on telling fairy tales for six or seven years. Thank you very much for uh, for highlighting the, the views of victims, especially important in this case. Uh, we have one question for Elliot. Um, that's uh, I cite. Uh, what are the best ways for those of us trying to help out online with geolocation, etc., to focus our efforts and make sure they are helpful? Well, um, so what we're doing at the moment is um, basically gathering as much information as possible from Telegram. And we, we have a large list of Telegram channels that we're scraping. Um, we also have people sending us stuff from the ground directly. Um, but what is most useful to us, um, we get lots of people offering to volunteer, but we have a kind of internal volunteer community that we onboard people on because because we're asking people to geolocate images from conflict zones as part of our volunteer community we have to take them through training to deal with vicarious trauma and other issues that can come from that and it's very important that we're dealing with that people understand those issues so when we onboard people we make sure that's part of it so it kind of makes that process a bit slow when we bring in that volunteer community into Bellcat and we're planning to expand that we have an internal volunteer platform for that but what we do have is um I would ask anyone, if you find a video and you geolocate it, just tweet it out with the word geolocation or geolocated, because we are searching for that keyword on Twitter and we will find anything with that word on and we will check it against our database of videos. And if it's not geolocated already, we'll pull it on. So if you want to get involved, the easiest way is to literally just tweet out that if you geolocated something. You don't even have to tag Bellingcat or me personally. As long as it's there, we'll discover it. Um, and But I would really encourage people to do that because it has actually proven to be incredibly valuable in the work that we're doing because it takes a long time to geolocate a video. And if you, you're dealing with hundreds of videos a day, 
um, and it takes you several hours to do each video. That's obviously for a small team. That's you know means that it's impossible to do that. But if people are sharing videos and they put coordinates with them, we can go to Google Earth, look at those coordinates, and very quickly establish within you know a minute or two if it's the quite correct location. So instead of you know three weeks' work, it's one day's work. So they go through all those 100 videos. So um, yeah, the best way to get involved at the moment is to do that. We are working very hard to um, bring together a, a basic coalition of organizations. We already are working with the Center for Information Resilience on producing a live map of um, videos that we've geolocated and verified. So um, you can find that on the, conf at the uh, Center for Information Resilience um, page. We're working with uh, the Conflict Intelligence team who has been working on issues related to um, Russian conflict for um, a number of years, including uh, Ukraine and Syria uh, and MH17. Um, they're, they're actually a, a group of Russians who've been working on this. So they're taking great personal risks, actually even investigating this stuff because Russia's, um, I don't know if they've passed the law yet, but they were talking about anyone who shares unofficial information about the conflict can face over a decade in prison now. And that includes the people in the conflict intelligence team. So these people take real risks to get this information out there. Um, but we're working with those organizations to ensure that all the work that they're doing is being collected and archived. So when we get to accountability processes, we know that stuff's there. Um, so, but yeah, anyone who wants to get involved at the moment, that's the best way to do it. Just write geolocation or geolocated on a tweet, which you've done geolocation and we will find it no problem. And then we will be able to preserve that for future use. Thank you Real, for sharing this insight. And the last question that we have for both of you, um, authorities often keep their investigative techniques secret, often for a good reason. What's the balance to be struck up there so that publishing doesn't take away sources for traditional investigators? And have there been uh, any disagreement between both of you on what should and should not be published? Um, so it's a question we get asked a lot. I mean, we were asked a lot about that question around the Skripal investigation where we uncovered the Russian spies. But when you're making a big allegation, you need to make sure you can support that with evidence and explain your working. Um, so that inevitably becomes part of it. Um, I mean, with MH17, we did see, um, you know, the 53rd Air Brigade investigation almost certainly resulting in the law being passed that prevented that. But that investigation would not have been kind of presentable without having that information included. Um, but it also encourages other people to, you know, figure out how to do stuff themselves. And often nation states are quite slow at reacting to this kind of stuff. So you have a nice little moment where lots of people are doing the same thing and revealing even more secrets. So, yeah, it, it's really, you know, it, we, we consider that all the time. But it, our feeling is it's best to be transparent and worry about what isn't available in the future another time. Because in the moment, there's often stuff that needs to be addressed and often addressed that can have a really big impact on people's lives and even you know saving lives as we think we did with the scripal investigation thank you and the final answer of today's webinar from pete yeah you know it's very important uh, transfer uh, transparency is of course very important also in the mh70 case but there is so now and then there's information that can't be revealed uh, uh, we have had discussions with uh, uh, with uh, uh, American uh, authorities uh, about the satellite images of uh, of the launching of the uh, of the book system. Uh, um, we didn't uh, the, the court didn't get them. Uh, the prosecution uh, service didn't get uh, these uh, these satellite images. Uh, and of course, we really wanted to get these 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 images. Um, but on the other side, uh, sometimes uh, transparency. Is it very sensible to do because they 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 can reveal state secrets uh, 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 the way how how uh, a country that has information. So we we understand. So it's 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 a, a difficult question. Transparency is very important. Publishing all uh, uh, available information is important, but it it has its boundaries. Uh, uh, it's it's not always possible, and uh, I yeah I can understand that. Thank you very much, Pete. Uh, and I think that wraps up the Q&A for today. Um, I would like to thank our speakers for joining us today and sharing their insights. Um, I also thank our audience for joining us uh, for such a great discussion. Uh, and I invite everyone to join us for the next webinar, which will discuss the role of the ICC in dealing with uh, the impunity in Ukraine that's right, right now rising. 
Um, I also invite everyone to follow our channel as we expect to launch our publication on crimes committed in Ukraine. And my special thanks go to anyone around the world who by one way or another joined forces to put an end to this madness, um, help refugees, victims, help document these crimes or just raise the voice in the protest taking place all around the world right now. Uh, which is always, I think, a nice reminder of shared uh, humanity. So by that, I conclude this webinar and I wish everyone a great rest of the day. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you.